Um, brilliant. Well, so good to be here today. Thank you, um, Hannah and Josh, for leading the service. And um, as they said, we are carrying on our sermon series today, which is really looking at the vision of this church. So it might be beneficial, particularly for those who are new. And if you are new, if you're visiting for the first time today, uh, or you've just been a couple of times, it's really great to have you with us. And this is a time of year where everyone's kind of starting things new. Uh, If you're a fresher here, uh, particularly warm welcome to you. If you're starting a new job or you've just moved to the city, uh, we're so glad that you're here. And it might be helpful for us to retrace some of the steps of where we've come from in terms of a church, and also think a little bit about our vision. So that's what we were doing. Last week, we looked at uh, Nehemiah chapter 1. Uh, This week, we're going to look at Nehemiah chapter 2, and I'm going to refer to 3 and 4 as well, and next week, we'll be on Nehemiah 5. So it's a short sermon series on really rebuilding the walls. So why rebuild the walls? What are we talking about? Well, COVID has had a huge impact on all of us, and I don't know how you're feeling about your life, about your faith, but I think it's shaken a lot of us. And we've all suffered in some way. Uh, We've lost, potentially, friends, family. We've certainly lost freedoms. We might have lost self-confidence. And you might be struggling in your faith. And if you are, then you're in good company because many, many other people are. The question that really we want to look at is, well, if that's the state of our lives at the moment, how do we rebuild? How do we rebuild what we potentially feel like we've lost or is broken? And Nehemiah is a great place to start for that, because Nehemiah was, uh, he, he lived a long time ago, 450 BC. Uh, he was taken from his hometown, Jerusalem, along with all the Jewish people, and exiled to Babylon, where they lived in captivity. Maybe you felt like a captive these last 18 months. Well, Nehemiah knew what it felt to have that, that feeling. And yet, there was this sense of hope because the king, Nebuchadnezzar, allowed them to return. In fact, uh, Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king, and many of the Jews had already returned to Jerusalem. But he felt strongly that God was calling him to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Describes in Nehemiah 1 that, that the walls are broken down and the gates are burned with fire. Well, city walls probably don't seem that important to us today. But in those days, they were essential because without walls, you couldn't defend yourself. In fact, you weren't a functioning city without them. So when he talks about rebuilding the walls, what they're really talking about is rebuilding from the ground up the very heart of their city again. And that's what we're talking about. How do we rebuild our faith, our church, and our city? The vision of this church is to play our part, and this is really important because we can't do this on our own. I can't do it on my own. This church can't do it on our own. We need everyone together, every single church together in this nation to do three things, to play our part in the re-evangelization of this nation. In other words, other people coming to hear about Jesus. Jesus is the best news. He's good news. And we would love as many people as possible to consider Jesus. That's why we've got those little 1102 cards uh, to give out to a friend. Maybe you want to invite someone along to Alpha in a few weeks' time. Secondly, to see the revitalization of the church. This was a church building with no church services going on in it for since the Second World War, a long time. And yet, people had faith. We talked about this last week. There was two old ladies who used to walk around here and pray for this church to be reopened as a church. And then three years ago, it was. And now it's full of people again. That's the revitalization of the church. And that's what we're praying for, not just here, but in the whole of Bristol and around the whole UK. And then thirdly, the revitalization of society, the um, transformation of society. That this society that we live in is broken. COVID has broken us even more, and it's those who are poorest who are most badly affected. And we want to have a, play a role in seeing that change. That's our vision. But we might think, well, where on earth do I fit into that? That sounds quite big. I mean, it's exciting, but how do I get involved? And that's what I want to talk about today a little bit. Nehemiah's response to the breaking down of the walls. The first thing he did was not take action, but to pray. Uh, we talked about that last week, the importance of, I had, I had a mnemonic, pray, P-R-A-Y, pause, 
Take some time out of your day regularly. Maybe it's at 11.02 to pray. Uh, Refocus on who God is, that he is the big king of the universe who can do anything and who listens to our prayers. Refocus. A, ask. Ask with confidence, knowing that God hears your prayers. And yes, why is for yes. Expect him to answer and step out in faith, expecting that to be the case. So the first thing Nehemiah does is to pray. The second thing he does, and this is what I want to look at today, is that he gathers a team. Nehemiah's not going to be able to rebuild the walls on his own. He needs a team. Teams are important. We all need a team. Even Emma Raducanu needs a team. Did you see? I don't know if anyone watched the the match yesterday. (laughs) Amazing. Out of nowhere comes Emma Raducanu. But one of the things she did at the end was she said, I I couldn't have done this without my team. And she lists her, her coach and her age and her fitness coach and all these different people, her family. You know, we need team. And this is what Nehemiah decides. He wants to gather a team. And so at the very beginning of the passage, which was a slightly obscure one that Josh was reading, verse 16 of chapter 2, he talks about a diverse group of people that he's going to ask to be with him on team. He talks about the Jews, which is basically all the people who were Jewish, who were all of his countrymen who lived in Jerusalem, so ordinary men and women. But then he also mentions uh, the priests and the Levites. So that's kind of church workers. Maybe the LDY would fit into that uh, particular category, uh, the leadership development year. Uh, and then there is the nobles and the governors. In other words, the ruling elite, those who were in charge. A very diverse group of people. It covers everyone, really. But he decides to speak to all of them and says, verse 17, Then I said to him, said to them, You see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Let us do it. Let's do it together. He's pitching to them. Do you want to be involved? And my question to you is the same thing. Do you want to be involved? Do you want to get involved in seeing those things happen? The re-evangelization of our nation the transformation of our society, the revitalization of our church in this nation. How do you do it? If you want to get involved, how do you do it? Well, uh, as sure as eggs are eggs, I have got a mnemonic again today for you, which is, last week was pray, uh, this week is team, T-E-A-M. Let me pull out four little points from this passage. T is for Take action. Take action. Don't wait for someone else to do it. Get involved. Verse 18b, the second part of 18, it says, They replied, this is their reply to his pitch, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. In other words, they said, we're in. We're in. We want to be involved. How can we get involved? We want to get stuck in. What can we do? And they see that the work is good, this good work. In other words, they see that it was necessary, important, and urgent. Now, the claim of the New Testament is that your life matters, that you as a person matter. That is the gospel. For God so loved the world, that's you that he sent his only son. You are not just a statistic. You're not just a unit of production or consumption. You're not just the product of random chance. God made you. He created you. And he loves you. The important thing is that if you understand that, if you grasp that, that will change the whole of your life. I've spent the last 30 years trying to understand that, the depth of that. You know, we had, um, we had uh, Sandy Miller, the, vicar, the old vicar of HTB, come and speak to our staff this week. And uh, he wrote a book which is entitled, All I Want Is You. And he said, you know what, that is the only thing that matters, that God says, all I want is you. I don't want your performance. I don't want your morality. I don't want your excellence. I don't want a great CV. All I want is you, your heart. And we say the the same thing to him. 
That's what happens in worship, what we were saying earlier. All I want, really, Lord, is you. To know that you've been created with purpose is transformational. And that's the claim of the New Testament. Uh, Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are God's workmanship, God's good work. God's good work was to make you. He thought, what shall I do? And he made you. And he looked at you and he said, yeah, it's good. It's good. It's good work. But then it goes on, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. In other words, you have value because you're created in the image of God. You're loved by him. But you can add value to the world around you because God has created you with a purpose. In fact, no one has got the same specific set of skills, personality, drives, experience as you. You're unique. You're unique. God wants to use you in a specific way that only you can fit. And we're not saved by works. Let's be clear. What we do doesn't impress God so that he goes, okay, you can come into my kingdom. No, no, no. None of us fit that bill. We... Uh, Three months ago, had, had a baby, our second child, uh, called Emmanuel. And um, she, is, uh, she is wonderful. Um, but I have to say, in our household, she's not a net contributor. She drains resources like nothing else. Money, time, exhaustion. I mean, she demands quite a lot. And she does not give a huge amount back. I have to be honest. And she needs to up her game. No, I'm joking. She doesn't really. Should we love her as she is. We absolutely love her as she is. And that's the way that God looks at you. You, know, you don't have to do anything. He just loves you because he loves you. But he says, that's not the end of the story. I've got great plans for you. God's got great plans for three-month-old Emma. She's not going to stay a baby forever. She's going to learn skills, and, and she's already got a personality. Same with you. You've got a personality and skills that God wants to use. So maybe you're here wondering, what on earth am I doing in Bristol? What, what on earth am I doing in this church tonight? Well, I don't think it's an accident that you're here, because God has great plans to prosper you and not to harm you. You may be thinking, well, what, take action. What do you mean? What shall I do? Well, your primary calling is to where you spend most of your time. So if, it, if you're a student, it's to your studies. God's called you to that. That's, that's your primary ministry, is your studies and the people who are around you, the people you'll come into contact with. If you have a job, it's to work. That's where God has called you primarily to have your ministry. Uh, if you are at home looking after children, that is your primary calling. Uh, maybe you're, you haven't got a job at the moment, you're looking. Well, God has a calling for you and a purpose for you, even in the midst of what you're going through at the moment. So you don't have to look elsewhere. God is with you right where you are. That's where your calling is. Martin Luther King uh, wrote, If a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should street, sweep the streets, even as Michelangelo painted or Beethoven composed music or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, Here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. And this is the same purpose Fullness that Apostle Paul shares, and he writes, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for people. So give yourself to your studies, give yourself to your work, give yourself to whatever you're doing, and the Lord will use you in that place. And the people that you come across will notice something about you. They'll notice something about, they won't tell you probably, but they'll notice something about the way you live your life. But it's not just about our, our work. That's our primary calling. But our, our secondary calling is as a group of people to come together to pool our resources, our talents, our abilities, our passions in the church to have an impact on society around us. I mentioned those things before. Evangelism, uh, transformation of society, social transformation, that is. And planting churches, revitalizing churches, all those things are what we're about. And what I love about this passage is in chapter 3, Nehemiah lists a few of the people 
who signed up to help him with the work. Here's, here's a little sample, verse 8 and 9 of chapter 3. Uziel, son of Hariah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section. So he repaired a section of the wall. And then Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs next to him. They restored the Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. And then Rephiah, son of Hur, ruler of the half-district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section. There's just three people. I've, there's a whole list of them. What an interesting list. You've got a goldsmith, a perfume maker, and the ruler of half of Jerusalem. I mean, that's a diverse group right there, isn't it? And none of them are in the construction business. And yet they all say, you know what, sign me up. I don't know how to build walls. I don't know about masonry. But I want to get involved because I want to make a difference. And can you imagine what that was like next to each other? You've got a perfume maker and then a goldsmith and then the ruler of half of Jerusalem. And the wonderful thing about the church is as we come together, we get stuck in. We actually have a great time getting to know one another as well. We have some teams uh, in uh, our church. And uh, we, you might, hopefully someone welcomed you on the door or gave you some coffee. Um, hopefully you enjoyed some of our worship and production. The production guys here are doing a fantastic job. Uh, these are all volunteers. These are all people who are thinking, I'd love to kind of help in some way. We have an amazing kids and youth and student team as well. Uh, we also have, um, we have loads of other teams going on. We have a social action team running uh, things at the food bank. We have a, an Alpha A team. We call them the A team. They're the team that basically run all the food and provide food. We've got all these different teams. And my question to you is, what would you love to get involved in? Where could you bring your passions and skills and get stuck in? So take action. That was my longest point. I've got three quick ones now. E-A-M. E is for encourage others. Encourage others. You know, most of us tend to self-disqualify. We think, I'm not sure I could do that. I'm not sure they'd want me. I'm not sure I'm good enough. I'm not sure I'm a good enough Christian. I'm not even sure I am a Christian. We say all those things, don't we? But what I love about this passage is a little phrase that's repeated over and over again in chapter 3. It says, next to them. Next to them was this person. And then next to them. And then next to them. It's like, can you imagine this big wall being built? And you've got all these random people building bits of the wall. And can you imagine the conversations that were going on? And now and again, someone would flag and go, oh, I'm t I've had enough of this. And the others would go, no, come on, you can do it. You can do it. You can keep going. I love that sense of encouragement. Again, watching the uh, Radicanu yesterday. But there was that, the encouragement of the crowd for both players. It really buoyed them up. It's amazing what encouragement can do. And what you can do is you can say to those around you, people you meet, friends, doesn't have to be in church, but you can give them courage. That's what we're, most of us are lacking is courage. Encouragement is to put courage into someone and say, you know you what, you can do it. I'm with you. I'm supporting you. And the world is full of discouragement. You know, most of the time we get discouragement. If you're ever on social media, one of the interesting comments yesterday after um, the match and um, they were talking about the change is going to come to Emma Raducanu in her life. And one of the comments was about social media. And they said the biggest piece of advice, these are ex-pros, saying the biggest piece of advice I would give Emma Raducanu is to not go on social media. Because you might get a hundred amazing comments, but it will be the one negative comment that she will latch on to. And that's what we do. We are sort of wired to do that. But for every one comment that we receive that's harsh, and we get a few, we need a hundred encouragements. So let's be an encouraging community that encourages one another to get involved. Your Mother Teresa said, I can do things you cannot. You can do things I cannot. But together, we can do great things. We need one another. So encourage one another. Uh, a is for anticipate opposition. Anticipate opposition. Chapter 2, verse 19. When Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing? They said. Can you imagine how 
that would have felt. These guys who are giving their all, trying to make the wall. And then suddenly there's people wandering around saying, give up, mate. You're a perfume maker. You can't make walls. It's going to be terrible. You know, oh, why bother? You're a goldsmith. Go do something that earns a bit of money. You're the half, you rule half of Jerusalem. You shouldn't be doing this menial work. That's kind of what they're saying. Did you know that these three were already in Jerusalem before Nehemiah arrived? And what's going on is they are really threatened by what's going on. They had had control before, and they're losing their control. And we face opposition. You will face opposition. If you step up to say, Lord, I want to give you my all, it's not going to be plain sailing. Because we face an enemy, not a person. We face an, a, a person who is unseen, an unseen enemy who would love to distract you, take you out of the battle, discourage you and say, it's not worth it. St. Paul puts it like this, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers. If you're doing something for God, you can expect opposition. Sandy Miller again said to us the other day, no blessing goes uncontested. If God blesses you, then there will be a challenge. And the voice of the enemy is discouragement. Don't bother. Why bother? You're not doing a very good job. Disappointment. Oh, it didn't go very well last time, did it? And also that person let you down. And you had that terrible experience that time in church. Don't, don't, why bother with that? Delay. Oh, it's not really happening now. You have prayed for this thing. It's not happened. Give up. Distraction. You'd be far happier if you did something completely different with your time. Doubt. Did God really say any of that stuff to you? Does he even exist? Those are the thoughts that the enemy loves to bring to us. And they're in the quiet, in the night. They come to you. And it's so easy to give in to them. But let me encourage you with what Nehemiah does. This is the last thing. M, maintain focus. Verse 20, he answered them. So the, these people who are opposing him. He, said, he answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. In other words, this is God's plan and not ours. God is far greater than you. Who are we to obey you in your discouragement when the almighty God has told us that we should do this? So you can be convinced, you can come back to the opposition that you maybe feel internally in your mind in the dead of night, and you can say, no, that's not true. I know some of these things to be true, that God loves me, that Jesus died for me, that he's filled me with his spirit, that he's got a purpose for me. He's got plans to prosper and not to harm me. In fact, he's got so much in store for me that I'm not going to give up. That's what Nehemiah does. You know, 1 Peter 2 says, resist the devil standing firm in the faith. Ephesians 6 says, put on the armor of God. When the day of evil comes, stand at your ground. The enemy wants you to look at anything but Jesus. Because when you look at Jesus, he says, I love you, I forgive you, let's go again. Don't look anywhere else but Jesus. Don't look inward at yourself. Don't look down at other people. Don't look around at the competition, but look upward to God. And he will cause you to move forward. He'll cause you to have courage He'll put people around you who encourage you. And as we do this together, the Lord will do great things. I have no doubt. You know, we're three years old as a church. Half of that has been in lockdown. We feel like a kind of toddler of a church, really. We're just beginning. But I have great faith. Not that I'm any good or even that you're any good, but that God is good. And he has good work for us to do together. So take action. Get involved. Don't be a critic or a consumer. Be a contributor. E, encourage others. You know, your words of encouragement will make all the difference to those around you. Anticipate opposition. It will come, but maintain focus on Jesus. Amen. Should we pray?
Lord, we thank you for Nehemiah. Thank you, Lord, for his courage, his determination to rebuild the walls. And Lord, if we're honest, we need some rebuilding. We need some rebuilding in our hearts. We need you to rebuild our faith, our love for you and for one another. We need rebuilding of the church, this church, every church in this nation. And Lord, we need to see the rebuilding of this whole nation, this city of Bristol. Lord, we pray that you would rebuild in us and through us. And so, Lord, we ask that you would encourage us. Put your spirit, the paracletos, the one who encourages us, the great encourager in us to motivate us. Lord, we pray that you would help us to fight off the lies of the enemy that say that we're not worth it, that we're not worthy, or that we could be doing something else. And we pray, Lord, that you'd help us to keep our focus on Jesus. Lord, we offer you ourselves today to be used by you. We say, sign us up. We're all in. And maybe just as we pray, there is, you just sense the Holy Spirit encouraging you. You know, that's what he does. He, he encourages, he's the great encourager. Maybe encouraging you to step out, to sign up, to join in. Maybe there's a particular passion that God has given you in the church. Maybe it's for those who don't know Jesus. Maybe it's for those on the margins of society. Maybe it's for those in the church. Maybe it's in worship. Allow the Lord just right now to fan that into flame. To encourage you to step out.